Recording in progress. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about introduction of trauma and trauma-informed care. And this is something that I'm a social worker. I'm a licensed independent social worker. And so this is something that people in the helping profession have talked about for years, but I was finally glad to bring it kind of to the general population. Um, so you guys can have a little understanding about what is trauma and the effects of trauma and also how to be more trauma informed. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh, you're, are you? No, you, I just need to click the screen sometimes. So try it now and it should work. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit about me, um, as Clara said, I'm the director of our social services. Um, I have a bachelor's in social work from BGSU and a master's from the Ohio State University. You have to throw the in there. Yeah. Um, so I did most of my undergrad and graduate work in the mental health field, um, either outpatient community mental health or inpatient psychiatric mental health. Um, I then worked in the field of mental health for about three and a half to four years at the Zeff Center um, in Toledo. And I worked as a case manager, and then I uh, also worked, um, got promoted to do intake clinical coordinating, which basically I was doing diagnostic assessments. So I was the first appointment that um, mental health clients came. When they came to the mental health center, I was the first person they saw. And so I would do long 13, 14 page assessments on all different types of their background, their life, um, their histories, what they've been through. Um, their childhood. Um, and so that's kind of where I really got an imprint of some of the trauma that people go through and kind of the impact on their day-to-day -day life. So um, I'm very interested in this topic. Um, I no longer work directly in mental health. Mental health. Um, obviously, I work here at the Wood County Committee on Aging. I've been here for 15 years. Um, the older adult population wasn't a population I initially intended to work with, but I love working with the older adult population. So, um, however, I do like to still have... Um, a little bit of connection to the mental health field. So, um, you know, I, I have ever since my employment here been part of the Wood County Suicide Prevention Coalition. I chaired it for many years, actually. Um, I'm still involved in that. So that kind of keeps kind of my um, connections with other mental health providers and whatnot. Um, and then I also have done some adjunct teaching at the university in the social work department at EGSU. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, so today, Okay, try again. Um, so today I first want to start off with a self-care alert. So some of the things we're going to talk about today are maybe a little bit heavier than normal topics that you might have come to in the past. So if you feel like you're triggered by anything that's discussed or shared, um, feel feel free to go outside, have a moment, take, you know, take a minute, take a little walk, um, because really your self-care is the most important thing. Okay. So if you need a break, take one. Um, so the things we're going to talk about today are um, to better have an understanding of what trauma is and how it can impact individuals and in the community, uh, how the trauma responses in our brain, and then we're going to talk about adverse childhood experiences and kind of the effects of potential effects of higher ACE scores, and we're going to talk about how to be trauma informed. So that's the, the goals or objectives for today. So I wanna first start off with some discussion. So when you think about the word stress, what are some descriptors that come to mind when you think of stress? What words come to mind? Anxiety. Overdoing, anxiety, okay. Headache. Headache, good. Anything else come to mind? Worry. 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 Some of my anger. anger, okay. Tired. Tired, yeah. Overwhelmed, those are all different types of descriptive words for stress. And stress can be good and bad, right? There's good stressors, there's bad stressors. Um, but what is, when you think of the word trauma then, what sort of words come up for you when you think of the word trauma? Hurt. Hurt, okay. Damage, pain. Pain. Death. Intense. Intense, right. So it's definitely, um, a little bit of more, you know, um, response that comes up when you think about trauma. It's a longer term type of problem, right? Um, so we look at the SAMHSA definition of trauma, which the SAMHSA is the Center for, or sorry, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. They say that the definition of trauma is um, 
It can result from an event, a series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Now, you'll notice it said that it's not the event itself, but it's the experience of the event. So one person might find the experience traumatic, whereas another person might not. And we're going to watch a quick video, and he kind of explains why that might be. Because again, what, what's traumatic to one person might not necessarily be traumatic, traumatic to someone else. So we're going to watch a quick video. I think this is a really good um, kind of just overview of um, trauma. And it's from Dr. Bessel van der Holt. And he wrote, um, he's a renowned neuroscientist and psychi psychiatrist, and he wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. So he's going to explain a little bit about trauma. And this is the one I want to stop at, like, I think it's like 619. 619, yeah. <laughs> I my technical support. The most important thing to know is that there's a difference between trauma and stress. As I like to say to people, life sucks a good amount of the time. We all have jobs and situations that are really unpleasant. But the moment that the situation is over, it's over. The problem with trauma is that when it's over, your body continues to relive it. My name is Bessel van der Kolk. I'm a psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and author of the book, The Body Keeps Its Core. I got interested in trauma on my first day working at the Veterans Administration. 1978 was the year, and the Vietnam War was over by about six or seven years. The very first day that I met Vietnam veterans, I was just blown away. These were guys who were my age, who were clearly smart and competent and athletic, and they clearly were just a shadow of their former self. Their bodies were clearly affected by trauma, and they had a very hard time connecting with new people after the war. Around that time, a group of us started to define what trauma is, and in the definition of PTSD, we write, these people have been exposed to an extraordinary event that is outside of normal human experience. In retrospect, that shows us how ignorant and narrow-minded we were, because it turned out that this is not an unusual experience at all. People usually think about the military when they talk about trauma, but at least one out of eight kids in America witness physical violence between their parents. A larger number of kids get beaten very hard by their own caregivers. A very large number of people in general, but women in particular, have sexual experiences that were clearly unwanted and that left them confused and enraged. So unlike what we first thought, trauma is actually extremely common. There was a lot of debate of 
what a trauma is to this day. But basically, trauma is something that happens to you that makes you so upset that it overwhelms you. There is nothing you can do to stave off the inevitable. You basically collapse in a state of confusion, maybe rage, because you are unable to function in the face of this particular threat. But the trauma is not the event that happens, the trauma is how you respond to it. One of the largest mitigating factors against getting traumatized is who is there for you at that particular time. When, as a kid, you get bitten by a dog, it's really very scary and very nasty. But if your parents pick you up and say, oh, I see that you're really in bad shape, let me help you. That dog bite doesn't become a big issue because the foundation of your safety has not been destroyed. We are profoundly interdependent people. And as long as our relationships are intact, by and large, we're pretty good with trauma. It's a subjective experience, and what may be traumatic for you may not be traumatic for me, depending on our personality and our prior experiences. The problem with trauma is that it starts off with something that happens to us, but that's not where it stops, because it changes your brain. Much of the imprint of trauma is in that very primitive survival part of your brain that I like to call the cockroach brain. There's a part of you that just picks up what's dangerous and what's safe, and when you're traumatized, that little part of your brain, which is usually very quiet, continues to just send messages. I'm in danger. I'm not safe. That event itself is over, but you continue to react to things as if you're in danger. We are talking about survival. We are talking about staying alive. And so some people are into fight flight, or on a more primitive level, people's brain shuts down and they collapse. You have these automatic responses that are not a product of your cognitive assessment, they're a product of your animal brain trying to stay alive in the face of something that that part of your brain interprets as a life threat. And the problem then becomes that you are not able to engage or to learn or to see other people's point of view, or to coordinate your feelings with your thinking. Traumatized people have a tremendous problem experiencing pleasure and joy. But the core issue is our hormones and our physiological impulses that have to do with survival. Your body keeps mobilizing itself to Thank you. Um, so real quick too, I forgot to mention the beginning of this. So this topic, I mean, I could go to week long trainings on trauma. So we're only going to like scratch the surface of this topic today. Um, but what were some initial takeaways or impressions of that information that you just heard about trauma? Anything that came to mind? Yeah. That it has to do more with the interpretation in the event itself. Right, yeah, how we experience it or how we interpret the event, absolutely. Liliana? That is something that we can't do anything about. That is something we can't do anything about. So initially, I think that's correct. You know, the trauma, traumatic experience is, you know, it might it might happen and occur. There, but we're gonna talk a little bit at the end about how there, it is, you know, treatable and how recovery is hopefully possible. Right. Even afterwards. Yes. Not there. Yes. Yeah. Physically, your body and your brain, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, is it's firing like you're in survival mode. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Each individual handles it and recognizes it differently. Right. Yeah. And he mentioned it could be our personalities, it could be our support systems, it could be our culture. There's a lot of different dynamics that go into 
again, what someone finds the experience of trauma to be, right? Absolutely. Very good insight. So, so just some takeaways from that video. Um, you know, trauma is definitely more common than we think. Um, it can affect how someone sees things, perceives things, interprets things. Um, and it also, trauma has no boundaries with regard to age, gender, socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, geography, or sexual orientation. It can impact any one of us. Um, and there are, you know, we're going to talk about our ACEs here in a little bit, but I'm sure there are a number of us in this room that have experienced past traumas. So it is extremely common. Um, and each, again, each person experiences it differently. So these are some emotional symptoms of trauma that you might see in someone who has, um, you know, is going through some trauma is feeling nervous, helpless, fearful, sad, depressed, being shocked, numb, or um, unable to feel joy, being irritable, having anger outbursts, getting easy, easily agitated, um, blaming yourself or having negative views of yourself or just the world in general, uh, being unable to trust others, getting into fights, trying to control everything. Oftentimes when someone experiences a traumatic event, they had no control over that event. So kind of to counteract that, they might become overly controlled. You know, they might want to control every aspect of their life. Um, being withdrawn, feeling rejected or abandoned, losing hope for the future, um, a feeling of detachment from others, being unable to concentrate or make decisions, feeling on guard um, or easily startled by noises or touches. Um, having dreams or memories that upset you, this could also include having flashbacks of the trauma, um, having problems at work or at school, and then avoiding people, places, things uh, related to the event. So those are all some emotional, potential emotional symptoms of someone that might uh, be experiencing trauma. There are also some physical symptoms of trauma as well. So in your body, uh, sometimes gastrointestinal issues, stomach issues, nausea, upset stomach, um, sleeping problems. And often people feel fatigued, um, pounding heart, rapid breathing, feeling shaky, having headaches, sweating, um, not keeping up with exercise, diet, or regular health care, and then you know smoking more, using alcohol or drugs more, or eating too much. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in, in just a second. So those are some of the physical symptoms. And again, there's a lot of emotional symptoms as well. So I'm no neuroscientist, but I'm gonna to try to give my um, explanation of how trauma can affect the brain. And Dr. Bessel van der Kolk kind of started that conversation for me. Um, so I'm gonna use a hand model of the brain that is actually by another psychiatrist, his name's Dan Siegel, but he has a hand model of the brain. So. Our brain has initially the brain stem. So the brain stem is the first part of our brain that develops in utero, and it controls all of our automatic responses that we don't even think about. Our breathing, our heart rate, our temperature regulation, when our bodies need to sleep, all of, all of that happens in the brain stem. And then the middle part of the brain um, houses this hippocampus and the amygdala. So the hippocampus is our emotion regulation center. And so the, the hippocampus also um, controls a lot of our memories. And it also is what connects the middle part of our brain to the upper part of our brain, which is our prefrontal cortex. So our prefrontal cortex is right here. And this is our thinking part of the brain. So this is where all of our reasoning, our understanding, um, evaluating things, you know, all that process happens in our upper brain, our thinking brain. Um, but going back to the middle brain, so or the lower part of the brain, the also in that it's called the limbic system. So the middle part, the hippocampus and the amygdala are in what's called the limbic system. The amygdala is our brain's smoke detector. So our brain is constantly scanning for danger, right? Um, so let's say a grizzly bear just walks into walks into this room. We are going to go into our amygdala. Amygdala is going to constantly just fire away, and so we're going to go into like fight, flight, or freeze response. And so, what happens in that fight or flight response? What happens in our bodies? 
Our heart's gonna, woo, yep, our heart's gonna, we're gonna maybe feel a rush of adrenaline in our body. What else? Our breathing might, you know, increase. And we're 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 thinking, are we running or are we fighting? So that's how that's and then that's an automatic response for survival. So um, so that's what happens in that amygdala. So unfortunately for individuals who are traumatized, their body stays in that fight or flight mode, even well after the trauma, traumatic experience has occurred. So they might continue to have, um, you know, they're thinking with their survival brain and their, their learning and thinking brain kind of goes offline, right? So it's not interpreting, it's not evaluating, it's not trying to regulate emotions or, um, you know, have any type of understanding. So, and there's a disconnect between the hippocampus and that upper part of the brain. So that's why sometimes they say that, you know, the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex can kind of go offline. And then you're, you're basically functioning in what's called survival brain, right? Your lower part of your brain. Um, so that can often happen, again, even when the absence of danger, you know, even when you're not in danger, those, those, Fire, you know, those those signals can still be firing for someone who's experienced a traumatic event. And they kind of explain that also in the video. So this can significantly impact someone's ability to, to learn things, to, um, to interpret things, to regulate their emotions, to make decisions. So when we think about kids that have been traumatized, how would that look like in a, like a learning environment like school, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're trying, you're trying to learn and teach them but they're not in the brain space where they're wanting to, they, they can you know, open up enough, let their guard down enough to feel safe to learn. So they're going to, you know, they're, they're in, again, paying attention, concentrating. Those are all things that happen up in our frontal lobe. So if there's a disconnect, then those kiddos are gonna have a lot harder time in school and a lot more problems in school because of the trauma that they've experienced. Um, so what, what goes from being a, a life-saving adaptive response, that fight or flight that we all need to survive, becomes maladaptive and it becomes life damaging essentially. Because again, those stress that stress response, the heart rate, the blood pressure, the increased cortisol and adrenaline remains after the traumatic event. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about ACEs. Has anyone in this room, I know Linda has. Heard of ACEs? A couple people? Okay, a few. So adverse childhood experiences, um, it came out of a study um, that was initially discovered by Dr. Vincent Paletti. And he was a, a physician at a Kaiser Permanente obesity clinic back in the late 80s, early 90s. And he was treating patients who were you know, morbidly obese, six, 700 pound patients, and he started asking the questions, hey, tell me a little bit about your background. Tell me a little bit about your experiences as a kid. And he started to kind of hit upon the fact that most of his patients had experienced some sort of abuse in their childhood, some sort of uh, situation that you know, kind of led to their current state. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, Dr. Robert Anda, with, he was working for the CDC, he also started some research on adverse childhood experiences. So the two of them came together and they created, um, they came up with about 10 potential background um, experiences in childhood that they believe leads, could, could potentially lead to negative coping mechanisms as we age. So you'll see in front of you there, um, this is the ACE questionnaire, okay? So there's questions on here about, did you live with anyone who was depressed, mentally ill or attempted suicide? Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker, alcoholic, or used street drugs? Did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? Were your parents separated or divorced? Did your parents or adult in your home ever hit, punch, beat, threaten to harm you? So that kind of assessing that physical abuse. Did your parents or anyone in your home often, um, oh, sorry, the first one was harm each other. So that's the domestic violence witness of a domestic abuse. And then this, uh, the other one is, did you yourself experience abuse? Um, and then there's also that question about, did you often get swore at, insulted, put down, 
again, that emotional abuse potentially. Um, there's you know a question about sexual abuse and then neglect. You know, were you neglected? Did you not have enough to eat? Did you wear dirty clothes? Did you feel like no one was there to protect you? And then finally, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? So those are the ACE questions. Um, so I'm not gonna ask you to share your ACEs or anything like that, but it's kind of just a self-reflective um, you know, self questionnaire to see. I mean, I'm sure we all have ACEs, at least one or, or two. Um, maybe some of us in this room have more. But they surveyed 17,000 people. Um, this is probably in the early 90s. And they found that um, about 70% had at least one ace of that 17,000 people. All right, so this video is going to share a little bit more about why th this, this you know, um, research is important. So do you mind? Oh, yeah, things like that. Awesome. Science tells us that the experiences we have in the first years of our lives actually affect the physical architecture of the developing brain. This means that brains aren't just born, they're also built over time based on our experiences. Just as a house needs a sturdy foundation to support the walls and roof, a brain needs a good base to support all future development. Positive interactions between young children and their caregivers literally build the architecture of the developing brain. Building a sturdy foundation in the earliest years provides a good base for a lifetime of good mental function and better overall health. So just how is a solid brain foundation built and maintained in a developing child? One way is through what brain experts call serve and return interactions. Imagine a tennis match between a caregiver and a child, but instead of hitting a ball back and forth across a net, various forms of communication pass between the two. From eye contact to touch, from singing to simple games like peekaboo. These interactions repeated throughout a young person's developing years are the bricks that build a healthy foundation for all future development. But another kind of childhood experience shapes brain development too, and that's stress. Good kinds of stress, like meeting new people or studying for a test, are healthy for development because they prepare kids to cope with future challenges. Another kind of stress, called toxic stress, is bad for brain development. If a child is exposed to serious, ongoing hardships like abuse and neglect, and he has no other caregiver in his life to provide support, the basic structures of his developing brain may be damaged. Without a sturdy foundation to properly support future development, he is at risk for a lifetime of health problems, development issues, even addiction. It's possible to fix some of the damage of toxic stress later on, but it's easier, more effective, and less expensive to build solid brain architecture in the first place. One of the things that sturdy brain architecture supports is the development of basic emotional and social skills, an important group of skills which scientists call executive function and self-regulation can be thought of like air traffic control in the child's mental airspace. Think of a young child's brain as the control tower at a busy airport. All those planes landing and taking off and all of the support systems on the ground simultaneously demand the controller's attention to avoid a crash. It's the same with a young child learning to pay attention, plan ahead and remember, and follow lots of rules. Like all of us, kids have to react to things happening in the world around them, while also dealing with worries, temptations, and obligations on their minds. As these demands for attention pile up, air traffic control helps a child regulate the flow of information, prioritize tasks, and above all, find ways to manage stress and avoid mental collisions along the way. Having this ability is a necessity for positive and level mental health. Developing effective air traffic control, overcoming toxic stress, and building solid brain architecture are things kids can't do on their own. And since strong societies are made up of healthy, contributing individuals, it's up to us as a community to make sure all young people have the kinds of nurturing experiences they need for positive development. To build better futures, we need to build better brains. All right. So you can kind of see the importance of that stability and growing up, you know, and how if someone doesn't have that stability and has a lot of these yeses, 
how that can affect their development, um, not only as far as their you know functioning, but also their learning, and um, it can lead to these adverse childhood um, experiences. So we look at this uh, pyramid here. So let's let's say that um, having a lot of these aces, we call them, um, might again lead a child to be to have trauma. Um, because of that trauma of those ACEs, we know that it leads to that disrupted neurodevelopment, you know, that brain um, impacting them. And so we know that that development leads to those social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. It can lead to mental health problems, maybe anxiety, depression. It could lead to those cognitive impairments, you know, maybe not being able to learn as well, having trouble in school. Um, again, all linked back to those ACEs potentially. Um, so now we have these kind of impairments here. And so to cope with these impairments, we are going to adopt some health risk behaviors. So what are what's a health risk behavior? Right. Maybe they start drinking when they're 13 years old. Overeating, Overeating using street drugs. These are all health risk behaviors, but they're doing it in order to try Try to cope unhealthily or unhealthy with that type of impairment. So they're using it as a negative coping skill. But because we've already adopted this health risk behavior, now it might lead us to disease, disability, or social problems. So now when we're 25, we might have cirrhosis of the liver, or maybe we might be physically disabled because we were um, you know, under substances and got into a car accident, or Maybe we might have social problems. We might be incarcerated because you know we were, were, were selling drugs or something like that. So we have these negative social problems and potentially those can then lead to an early death. So that is kind of the impact of higher ACEs in general of how it can affect um, you know, individuals even in the long term, right? So, these are some of the ACEs that increase risk, depression, suicide, substance abuse, teenage pregnancy, multiple sexual partners, self-injury, being victim of a crime, delinquent behavior, domestic violence, serious job problems. So those are all some of the uh, potentially ACEs can increase those risks, as well as it can increase risk of heart disease, smoking, a severe obesity, physical inactivity, HIV or STDs liver disease or chronic lung disease. So that's what, you know, the potentially higher ACEs um, can also lead to. So in um, Wood County, we have every two years, uh, we actually have a Wood County Youth Survey that we actually survey all of the Wood County youth, um, typically age uh, middle school to high school. And about six years ago, uh, we started asking he, we started asking the youth of Wood County about their ACEs. So they were asked these same questions in Wood County, seventh through 12th graders. Um, and they, they put out a report every two years. Um, this is funded by the Wood County Alcohol, Drug Addiction, Mental Health Board, as well as in partnership with like the Wood County Educational Service Center. Um, and they asked a lot of questions on the survey. They asked about <laughs> drug use, vaping, gambling, gaming, all kinds of different things. But about six years ago, they actually started asking our youth in Wood County what their ACEs were. And so, oh, I jumped ahead a little bit. So like I said, the original ACE, our ACE study, but with um, the two positions, about 70% had at least one. 21 and a half of the individuals, or 21 and a half percent of the individuals had four or more. In Wood County, um, and then this was just in the fall, um, of the males ages 12 to 18, uh, you'll see about 10% had four or more, and females in Wood County, um, almost 15% had four or more ACEs. So then what they do is they look at those ACEs, the population that did report the higher ACEs here, and then they ask them questions about their mental health. So tell me about, you know, have you thought about suicide? Have you attempted suicide? And then they correlated those figures. So as we see, as the number of ACEs increase, so does the percentage of at-risk behaviors. So of that population that reported four or more, 53% had had suicidal thoughts 
and 22% had attempted suicide. So you can see the prevalence of those higher ACE scores, right? Um, even within our own county, within our own youth. Um, so I thought I wanted to share you this with you because I, I know I think it's important to, um, to consider and to understand that this is somewhat of a prevalent, you know, issue um, and how to go about, you know, helping. So any questions about the ACEs? Yeah. Another little question. I'm just stunned by the, if you had two even, like a quarter mm -hmm. of the mm hands -hmm. have thought about suicide. That's yeah, kind of striking. And, and you'll see like, you know, even people that had zero ACEs, you know, and this could be, you know, just, you know, <laughs> just because I don't have any trauma doesn't mean I'm not susceptible to mental illness or depression, you know, there's other factors that can go into it. So I'm definitely not saying that 100% if you have four or more, you know, but yeah, you'll see that though, correlation wise, though, the more ACEs you have, the higher the number, but yeah, you're right. Even one, um, 14% and, you know, of ideation and 3%, 3.7% for suicide attempt. So, yeah, I mean, it pretty much progresses the more you have. Yeah. What year was this taken? So the, they call it the 2024, I, I put, but it, these were given in the fall of, of this current school year. So, so after COVID. No, no. Yes. Yeah. Yes, after, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Years. Like just like September, October. Yeah. Because I know a lot of the kids had difficulties. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Locked down yeah. at homes and not. So it would be interesting twice. to pull the what would be the twenty, 20 yeah, and the like, two years ago or twenty nineteen years ago, ago, yeah. To compare them all. Did you have a question? Yes, I just wondered if there's been any type of guesstimation as to what it may have been twenty, forty, and sixty years ago. I mean, I know it's you that's know, a really yes, good question. I don't think it's even because you know. I mean, you was it talked about back then? Yeah, very quiet, right? Right, you would say it happened. Yeah. Oh, of course it happened, but it was definitely different. Did you repeat what she said? She said, "I wonder what the studies would be if you looked at like forty or fifty years ago, before this was even really a concept, because obviously trauma still happened, right? Um, but it wasn't really as prevalently talked about or studied back then as it is now. But you don't know if the suicide rate was lower or was just the first time it was Right. You, know, you don't know. You really don't. Yeah. I just think it would be curious to see how the advent of social media um, impacted the numbers over the last um, decade or so. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Social media brings in all other kinds of, of issues. Yeah. Uh, now, with those numbers being so high, I mean, who sees this? Like the teachers or the nurses? I'm just wondering if they actually talk to those kids and, and you know, to find so, out what's bothering them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, luckily, we're fortunate in Wood County. We do have counselors in most of the schools. Um, unfortunately, this is an anonymous survey. So these people in particular weren't identified. This is an anonymous survey. Um, but there are counselors in all the schools. And I know the teachers have been trained on this, you know, ACEs and mental health wise, like what the kids need. Yeah. Yeah. Do they know which schools they came from? I mean, does each school interested to get maybe a report of what they are needing? I believe so. Yes. Yes. I believe so. Yeah. But again, there's not, it's not, it's an anonymous. And now it's online too, but yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, you're like, you're at a high percentage. Yeah. It's there somewhere. Yeah. 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 But I, doesn't it just make sense? I mean, when you think about the ACEs, I mean, to me, it's like everything kind of falls into place and you kind of have a, a lot better understanding of someone who you might have maybe put judgment upon in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So now, and we're going to talk about a little bit, that goes a little bit more into like trauma-informed care that I'll talk about in a minute. But it just makes sense, right? So how do we help, you know, what, what can we do? Um, but this kind of gives us that background into knowing like, okay, this probably is why this person is behaving this way um, or is having these symptoms, right? Um, all right, so that kind of leads us into how can we can help. So the first thing I always wanna make sure is, you know, there's always, I wouldn't be a social worker if I didn't feel like there was wasn't hope, right? 
So even someone who has high ACEs, who has trauma, there is always hope. There is treatment options available. Um, and you have to hold out that aspect of healing that there is hope. Um, it's a critical component for positive change. And recovery is, is possible. So even though someone might have many ACEs or many tra past traumas, you know, there is things that um, they can do to, um, to try to get better. And one of the main things for resiliency for someone who's experienced trauma is those interpersonal relationships. That is almost key to healing from trauma. It's going back to that video. It's the foundation of their, of their, their, um, you know, their mental capacity is safety. So building that foundation back. So having a relationship that's supportive, having a relationships that are, that the person believes what you're saying, they believe in your experience, um, that they're constant and always there regardless of the condition and someone who is basically safe and non-judgmental. So the biggest resiliency factor in the face of trauma is interpersonal relationships. Yes. And I would imagine that the earlier you catch the person, the better, right? Yes, absolutely. Because I just joined, I start next week, so I'll ask a lot of questions, but I just joined the breakfast buddies with the kids in the elementary school. In oh, grade. okay, nice. And that's exactly what I, what they yes. want, an adult yes. that is always there with them, mm -hmm. that is supportive, and that is non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, yeah, and I think that's important to know what our role is in the community is, as far as being trauma-informed is, if unfortunately, if a kiddo is not getting that support at home, hopefully they have a supportive teacher or a counselor at their school or a volunteer that helps them, that are a mentor in some way, because that can help kind of you know, offset that um, response, basically, if they yeah, feel that so foundation. The one I have assigned is a kindergartner. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah that's awesome. Um, another thing to consider when we look at a foundation for recovery from trauma is individuals who are, you know, these characteristics are linked to um, protective factors or resiliency. So people have a better outcome at healing their trauma if they possess these sort of things. So connecting with others, such as family and friends, coping with stress effectively, not avoiding it, um, finding positive meaning in the trauma, um, having social support, helping other people might be a part of their protective factor, um, holding belief that there is something that can be done to manage your feelings. So that kind of is that self-efficacy. They feel like they can overcome it. Um, they identify as a survivor as opposed to a victim. They have positive self um, help seeking behaviors. They self disclose the trauma to loved ones and they have some component of spirituality. So these are things that we consider protective factors for individuals who might have gone through trauma. They have the best outcomes and the best results when these things or some of these things are present. Okay. So what can we do to be trauma-informed? So the first thing, you're all here today, so you're taking the first step to be trauma-informed um, because really the first step is realizing the issue, right? Realizing that this is a widespread impact on, our, on individuals in our community. So we always wanna realize the prevalence of trauma and be aware of the different paths that someone can take um, who might be struggling with trauma. Um, pre you're basically creating that support, supportive community. That's really important. Um, we also want to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, so we kind of went over those emotional and physical symptoms of trauma and be open-minded and compassionate uh, towards others as trauma can happen to anyone and it can take on a lot of different forms. So we want to realize, recognize. We also wanted to respond to uh, in a trauma-informed way. So basically with a lens of empathy and respect. I also like to call it a trauma-informed lens. So looking at a lot of different factors with an individual, and we'll get to this in a minute, but looking at it through a lens of not what's wrong with you, looking at it through the lens of what happened to you, right? Very different things. What's wrong with that person? 
to what I wonder what happened to that person, right? So that's that lens of empathy and respect. Um, and then we don't we want to resist any re-traumatization. So we definitely don't want to push someone to tell us their story if they're not willing to or ready. Uh, we also don't need to always solve their problem. You know, sometimes we just need to be empathetic um, and allow them to share in their own time and their own space. Um, and we don't want to, we want to try to prevent any re-traumatization. So those are kind of the four R's of being trauma-informed. And like I said, you guys are all here today, so that's good. You're taking that first step to learn this information. Um, so another thing about being trauma-informed is understanding that all behavior has meaning, right? All behavior has meaning. So we want to try to get to the causes of the behavior and kind of identifying what the needs might be, right? So all behavior has meaning. Um, and again, change that question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Um, we want to value that person's lived experience as expertise. So they've been through it. They've, they've lived through it. Um, so we want to rely on that survival as a, as a strength that they, you know, they have made it thus far and they do have strengths that they can um, rely on. And we want to create a trauma sensitive culture. So again, some, a culture that's safe, that's non-judgmental, that's collaborative, and that's based on building relationships. So that's really important to being trauma informed. Um, we definitely have to change our way of thinking. Um, and we want to make sure, again, that we view others through a trauma-informed lens. And I always like to say that um, you, one does not have to be a therapist to be therapeutic, right? So we can all do our, our part to try to help someone who might be struggling. Um, one does not need to be a therapist to be therapeutic. So I want to um, share a quick video. This is a video by um, Brene Brown. Has anybody heard of Brene Brown? Okay. So this is a video about empathy versus sympathy. And I think I really liked how she laid it out. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show that next. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you can climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. 
if I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What yeah. makes something better is connection. Okay. Yeah, I, I really like that video because I think it goes back to, again, that relationships, you know, interpersonal relationships and connection. Um, even Beth Vanderpolt said, you know, are, we're very interdependent species. So um, we're, you know, that's something to consider. Any takeaways from that video? Anybody else have anything to add or um, anything? No. All right. So again, some do's and don'ts um, of how to help someone that may have experienced trauma. You know, we don't want to call them crazy. We don't want to say it's all in their head. Um, assume that you know what they're going through. Um, we don't want to judge or try to fix them. Uh, we won't, don't want to tell them to get over it. Um, tell them that they're overreacting. You know, those are all things we don't want to do in the face of trauma. Um, but hopefully what we all do instead is we acknowledge the reality of their struggle. We listen to them, encourage them, support them, respect their space and boundaries, and we ask how to help um, and support them. So, um, so that's kind of in the gist how to be trauma-informed and how to view um, your relationships through a trauma-informed lens. Because we all have are going to encounter some of the trauma, and we ourselves may have had trauma. So we also need to have some compassion for ourselves as well, right? So what questions do you all have um, about the topic today? Anything that comes up for you all? Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have heard of or are familiar with like if you had your trauma, you don't know the trauma, but you're behind that. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what the whole book, The Body Keeps the Score, is on. So she said, you know, um, you, know, you have you heard about, like, if you don't remember the trauma, but your body remembers the trauma? Absolutely, that can... Yeah. Can I give you the example? Yeah, here. <laughs> sure. Um, I have a daughter-in-law, and just before she turned three, she and her two-year-old daughter... This is in Minnesota. We're riding in the back of the pickup with her parents in Oregon, and they ran off into a tree. And the parents were killed, and they were hanging there until some loggers came by and found these kids. So, of course, she doesn't remember it, but she's 42 now, and it, it colored her entire life. She She's been an alcoholic, she's been a pigatomania, she's gone to Minnesota because she's sure she could find their goal. With it. I mean, I yeah. try to listen, but some of it just gets so far, I don't know how to. Yes, so it, it definitely can continue and, and impact people well beyond, you know, even if they are so little that you don't think that they remember, absolutely. Um, that is something that can occur. Now, I guess another, I'd be curious, like as far as the foundation, when they were brought up, uh, they had well, stability. So my dad was killed. Right. So the mom's sister adopted them, which gave her six kids, four of them, the same age. And that woman was not. Yeah. So, so <laughs> right. So yeah. that's, that's what she grew up in. Right. Another chaotic environment. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that definitely is not, you know, going to be an environment that she was probably able to feel safe in. And so, and unfortunately, her trauma is just kind of continued, you know, and then, of course, her maladaptive behaviors. And now I see it projected out of her side. Yeah. It, it, it's unfortunately, you know, it can sometimes be a cycle. Um, there is such a thing as generational trauma. Um, I, I'm not going to get into that today, but uh, but yeah, that, that, unfortunately, that sometimes can be a cycle. So yeah. So I don't know how to be more empathetic when she gets the really soft wall. 
I think just always trying to be there to support. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, just if, if you can, like, I don't know if she's, if she's attempted any treatment programs or any counseling or mental health. I'm sure she's had. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, if sometimes there's, there is no good answer. You know, if someone's not willing to take the steps to try to heal from the trauma, um, I just often wonder if she thinks these are ways that are healing, like the other sister who was in the accident, she moved to Australia because they said that she would find your parents' spirit there. I mean, it's like the whole family in the way. Yeah. Yeah, but that tra tra young traumatic experience, you know, that can, yeah, it can really affect yeah, someone long term. Mm -hmm. Remember the accident. Yeah. So, I wouldn't think at two and a But they just on there for that overnight. So, we long time. Yeah, that's a very traumatic experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, were you going to say something? Um, well, for one thing, when you're growing up and you've been traumatized, however, you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. or what you didn't get. And yeah, when you care, right, you don't know what's missing within yourself. And another thing, as you're growing up and you didn't get a good enough foundation, like from your aunt. You're a surgeon. You're always surgeon. Like she doesn't have it to give because she didn't get it. She, didn't she never had she never had that safe stability for a caring caregiver to learn, you know, adaptive coping skills, you know, to learn. And then also the trauma, again, if it happens in kids, it can affect the communication between that rational, logical thinking learning part of our brain you yeah, know those connections yes i mean they do look at traumatized children's brains versus kids that maybe didn't have go through trauma and their brains are physically different yeah 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 it's all it's almost i only talk about child but it's almost like this can be broken up in three parts childhood middle age and elder age I mean, you could have a fine childhood mm -hmm. and something happens in middle age. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Or you're fine up to middle age mm -hmm. and you can't deal with elderly. Or you have a traumatic experience yeah. when you're, yeah, in your 70s. Yeah. 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 I mean, then you talk about the soldiers coming back. And that wasn't recognized, but that goes all the way back if you look at the the wars that goes yeah. through back to the revolutionary yeah. Wars. yeah but you're absolutely right like i said in the beginning it doesn't discriminate based on age gender you know you know we kind of the, a lot of the research is focused on childhood trauma mm -hmm. but no it can I mean it can happen at any age you could have a traumatic event and then all of a sudden we're in that trauma response yeah, yeah. absolutely something happens in your childhood <clears throat> but your defense system very soon. And then somewhere along in your age, something triggers it. It's possible too, yeah. Uh, so what are some common um, things that can consider be considered traumatic events other than war? You know, car accidents, yeah. um, what else? Pandemic. Pandemics, yeah, weather events, hurricanes, fires, uh, you know, tsunamis, all that. Right. Um, what's that? Right. Yeah, sexual assault or rape. Physical abuse. Uh, when you're very young. Yeah. So um, one of the traumatic event could be like a sudden illness or a major life event, surgery or something like that. A, a terminal illness as well can be a, considered a traumatic event. Yes. Verbal abuse. Yes. Verbal emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A response to death. Yeah. Sudden loss. Yeah. Unexpected sudden loss can be a traumatic <laughs> event. It's not sudden. I I, I heard. Some research with grief. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So grief and loss mm -hmm. is traumatic. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's lots of different things. Again, at any age that you can experience that could create this trauma response. Absolutely. Yeah. So far, we've been talking about the children mm -hmm. and the concept of forces in the middle, and we can apply it to another group in the spectrum, which is 
the seniors. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? Could well, you give us a few? Well, I can't, like we just talked about, I mean, you could be any age and experience a traumatic event. So a lot of the research is with child experiences, but you could be walking down the street today and, you know, witness something that you find threatening and you could have a traumatic response. You know, it can happen at any age. Like we said, trauma does not discriminate age, race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status. So you can experience traumas at any age. Um, you know, I, so I don't know if that, that answers your question or not. Um, I will say also though, I think having the information and understanding childhood trauma, because it wasn't really talked about in your youth or in your middle adulthood, now maybe you would have a better understanding of even your own upbringing and kind of the impacts that have had, maybe has had on your life too. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Then there was uh, a little talk about how these building blocks mm -hmm. of childhood brain get together and how trauma affects that. Can we apply that to senior ages and say how trauma affects that or does it make any changes in there? I think, you know, as far as trauma in late, later adulthood, I feel like, again, kind of going back to those recovery, like, you know, the treatment for trauma and recovering, trying to recover from trauma, it would be maybe potentially, you know, counseling, maybe medication, but also building a foundation of safety and good relationships. So all of those types of things need to be in place for someone to try to attempt to heal from the trauma. Um, I, I believe um, that that's, you know, what someone, again, if you're an older adult who experienced a trauma, unfortunately, tomorrow, you know, those would all be the things that I would recommend that you, you seek, you know, that you do talk therapy, that you have positive, supportive, empathetic relationships in your life. Um, those are all really important blocks to overcoming a trauma. So yeah. in a sense, the senior center mm -hmm. is doing a lot in this context for the senior. I mean, I, I, absolutely. Here, you know, we're all about like lively you and learning and building supports and connection and, you know, um, having meals together and having that socialization and that fellowship. So absolutely. Yeah. This can be a definitely a positive support in someone's life. Yeah. I think by the time we've reached 70, 80, 90, even we've built a more secure type um, foundation because of all the things we've gone through and all the different levels of people that have helped us. So That's we're true. able to, you know, handle it a little bit better than a child that hasn't yeah. grown. Right. Unless you really are going to be there for a while, like I know. Well, <clears throat> And there. Yeah, there are certain, and that is part of the trauma response sometimes that people do alienate, alienate themselves, and that is a symptom of potentially the trauma. Yeah. But you're right. I do agree. Like, it, yeah, typically in older adulthood, you have that foundation pretty much set. Um, yeah. Only if you live in the same place most of your life. Because if you move a lot, true, you know, yeah. Connections <laughs> that you used to have yeah. that are not available yeah. to you. That's true. Quite often, and yeah. still have friends from all different areas because I stay in touch with. Yeah. <laughs> well, when he was saying all the ages, when you think of 9 11, that trauma. Right, that, that, ages, yeah. That yeah, even like community violence, school violence, all of that. Yeah, even if you weren't as directly, a, even if you weren't directly even involved or knew someone, like it, you can experience that trauma too. Yeah, absolutely. School shooting, but yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope that I gave you guys again, just scratched the surface of this topic, just gave you some food for thought. Um, but if you don't take away anything that I said, um, just remember trauma informed lens, ask yourself the question, what happened to the person, not what's wrong with the person, right? So, or it would be what happened. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.